Good morning, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us and welcome to this webinar called Step by Step, the HIG FEM Verification Trail, Section 3, Energy and Greenhouse Gases. We from Leadership and Sustainability are looking forward to spending the next hour with you. This is the second in a series of webinars where we will take you into depth into the different sections of the HIG FEM, the Facility Environmental Module. My name is Karen Ekberg, and I'm the founder and manager of the consulting company Leadership and Sustainability. I have spent nearly 35 years in the sustainability area, worked in many different sectors, but during the past 10 years, I have focused on the textile sector. Before I started my own company a few years ago, I worked several years at Adidas in the role of head of environmental services, developing and implementing the first environmental strategy with inclusion of all business functions. Today, I will introduce you to the SAC HIG FEM, the Facility Environmental Module, continuing with Section 3, the Energy and Greenhouse Gas section. After you have gained an insight into this section, I will present you also with some of the energy best practice examples, and then we have time for your questions and a discussion. And afterwards, I would like to briefly introduce you to a new opportunity of benchmarking with HIC FEM. And finally, we will make you an offer and present our team to you. And now let me introduce you to the verification trail. The purpose of the verification trail, this webinar series, is to give you a better and deeper understanding of the HIC FEM. We will take you through the HIC FEM section by section and make you acquainted with all requirements. We held the first sep uh, webinar in September about uh, site info and permits. And before we continue our trail, I would like to give you an overview of the verification process in general. We have identified seven simple process steps I would briefly like to go through with you now. So you begin by engaging a verifier and provide information on your company and uh, the levels that you have achieved in the self-assessment, for example, if you have already done the self-assessment. So items one and two on this slide here, you may do the self-assessment first and then engage the ver verifier or vice versa. And um, once you have completed the self-assessment, you can make the self-assessment available to the, uh, to the verifier. And also you need to have the VFEM module as well. So you have your FEM module and you also have your VFEM module. So you need both modules if you want to uh, verify. And then uh, the verifier will review the self-assessment and all the documents that you have uploaded to the, to the platform and will inform you about any issues before uh, the verification and will of course also send you an agenda ahead of the on-site visit. And then we have the on-site verification and we have the reporting, the finalization of the verification, and also you can uh, post your results. SAC has issued a protocol for on-site verification, which gives information about the verification process. And you can see the link here, down here. So you will receive it. Once you have received this deck, you can click on those links as well. Then some general, but Still very important advice to all of you who are doing your self-assessment or are preparing to get verified. Appoint a person who is responsible to complete the HIG FEM self-assessment on an annual basis. Read the How to HIG and the verification preparation guidance for facilities. The How to HIG is a very long document, I'm aware of that. Um, but it is also very helpful in order to understand the questions and what is expected. Uh, so there is quite a lot of detailed uh, guidance in the How to HIG. Then respond to the questions comprehensively and document all responses. And please also upload as many documents as possible. SAC requires documentation proof for nearly all questions. The SAC guidance on how to verify the how to hit guidance is very strict regarding documentation. And uh, also it is much easier for the verifier to prepare for the verification if it's possible to have a look at the documents beforehand. And in any case, uh, during the verification, so 
you should have all documents available. And then be clear when setting targets and baselines. Baselines, you need to define them well. They should also be stable. So for example, you choose a baseline year of 2017, and then you will set your annual goals comparing with 2017, also moving forward. Be aware of the time you need uh, to invest into filling out the self-assessment. And of course, the ultimate goal is to have improvements every year, year by year. So uh, let's continue on the trail. Here you can see an overview of all the sections that are included in the FEM module. On September 3, we went through sections 1 and 2, and now we move on to the section, so the third section, energy and greenhouse gas. So let's have a look at the third section, energy and greenhouse gases. The largest man-made sources of air pollution and greenhouse gases derive from energy production and energy use. Taking climate change as the most severe human, environmental and economic risk into consideration, governments may impose more stringent requirements and regulations. So if your facility reduces its energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions, it will help to reduce also its exposure to such regulatory risks and requirements, but it will also help save costs. The energy section in the HIG FEM promotes the implementation of a successful energy program and also evaluates the facility's progress. So uh, to achieve this, it requires a strong focus on operational activities, as well as how resources are used while reducing the impact on the environment. This includes to track all energy and fuel sources and report quantity used in last in the last calen calendar year. Identify which factors contribute most to energy use on site. Set a normalized baseline for energy use. You can set also an absolute baseline if you wish. We will talk a bit more about that later. And also set normalized targets for energy reduction. You can set absolute targets as well if you wish. Set an action plan with specific actions. This is of course very important. It's not enough to just set targets. If you don't have an action plan on how to reach your targets, you, will, you may not reach, be able to reach them. And then to demonstrate energy reductions against the baseline. And we will deep, uh, dive deeper into these requirements now during this webinar. So let's have a look at energy sources. You see here, and an overview of potential energy sources that are owned or controlled by your facility. These must be tracked. It also includes energy sources that are not used in the manufacturing process, such as, for example, canteens, dormitories, etc. To make sure you measure your energy sources accurately, we provide you also with a link to the greenhouse gas protocol that gives you further guidance. So these um, energy types used in your factory on site, they belong to what is called scope one, according to the greenhouse gas protocol. So next to own generated energy sources, there is also the option to purchase electricity, chilled water and, and or steam. And I'm sure most of you do that. And those energy sources, they are called scope two energy sources, according to the greenhouse gas protocol. Now, taking a closer look at your facility, here are a few of the common machines and equipment which use energy, such as boiler, compressed air system, motors, generators, HVAC, heat and ventilation and air condition devices, incinerators, chillers and burners, dryers, lightning, product, product, production equipment. So as a consequence, your factory's energy use generates direct and indirect greenhouse gas emissions, as you can see uh, also in this picture. So these emissions are divided into three different scopes according to greenhouse gas protocol. Scope one are all direct greenhouse gas emissions, for example, from fuels used in boilers. Scope two are all indirect greenhouse gas emissions 
from consumption of purchased electricity, heat or steam. And then we have scope three. Those are all other indirect emissions, such as the extraction and production of purchased materials and fuels, transport related activities in vehicles not owned, etc. And the HIC FEM tool provides also a greenhouse gas calculation for both scope one and scope two. So identifying and managing the source and amount of greenhouse gas emissions can benefit your factory in several ways. Reduce energy cost. So energy is actually one of the most um, uh, easiest way to save costs as well. It's a strong linkage, of course, between energy consumption and energy cost. You can also increase competitive advantage. You can get a start on future regulations on carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. And it's also all about environmental stewardship. So managing environmental resources well. And then we have the different sections um, in, in the uh, energy and greenhouse gas um, area. We have three levels here. At level one, uh, it's only about tracking the, your energy sources. And then at level two, you can see here, there are lots of other questions, baselines, targets, improvement plans, and also improvements. And at level three, we have one question regarding scope three emissions. So let us now walk through the energy and greenhouse gas section, step by step and question by question. The first requirement, deals, and this is now the level one. It's the first and only question at level one in the energy section. And the first requirement deals with the selection of all sources of energy for your facility with corresponding questions according to your energy source. Does your facility track its energy use from this source? What quantity of energy was used by this source in 2018? Which method was used to track this energy source? Are you using bills? Are you using meters? Any other, uh, are, they, uh, are the um, quantities estimated? What was the frequency of the measurement? And then you also have the opportunity to provide any additional comments. The intention of the first level is that the measurement of all energy sources allows you to analyze your biggest energy drivers, detect any abnormal consumption, set energy reduction targets, and measure greenhouse gas emissions. You will receive full points if you are completely tracking all sources of energy that your facility uses, both scope one and scope two. And you will receive partial points if you're completely tracking at least one of your energy sources, but are, are not yet tracking all of your energy sources. At level two, the first question, has your facility set baselines for energy use? And the intent of this question is, it's important to know what your starting point is. Therefore, a baseline provides you with an overview and a clear reference point for ongoing energy performance tracking and target setting. During the verification, we will ask you to explain how the baseline was calculated. Was it absolute or normalized? We will ask you about unit of measure we will check this. The drop down list contains unit or measures only for absolute baselines only, unfortunately, but you can still add normalized values and describe how the baseline was calculated. So here you can see a screenshot of what the window looks like where you can enter this information. And uh, I also wanted to give you an example of a normalized baseline and how to calculate that. In our setting here, we consumed 1 million kilowatt hour of electricity and we produced 500,000 garments. And the year here was 2017. In order to calculate the normalized baseline electricity usage, we divide the electricity consumption by the production volume in 2017. And this is how we achieve the result of two kilowatt hour per garment. So it's quite a simple um, division that you make, uh, but it's of course, it's important that you have the quantities correct uh, from the outside outset. And also that you have evaluated if this 
normalization if it also makes sense to you. So if you have very similar products that you produce in your factory, uh, it may make sense. If you have very different uh, products, very, some very small products that can be produced very fast and some larger products and perhaps the ratio between those two different product groups, they are changing a lot, then it might be difficult to measure just with the number of garments. And you may want to use a standard time instead. And also comment regarding absolute or normalized values. When setting targets related to energy consumption in manufacturing, it often makes sense to normalize the targets. For example, to calculate the energy consumption per production unit, as we just did. This way, if your production goes down or up, you will not be punished or suddenly crediting, credited for something you couldn't influence. With normalized targets, you can make sure that you have comparable results, even though production goes down or up. So for example, one year you have you are working at 100% of your capacity. The next year, perhaps you are working only at, let's say, 90% of your capacity. So you are producing much less garments. And then you would also probably uh, reduce your energy consumption. But that reduction would only be based on the lower production volumes you have and not uh, on savings that you would have where you would really have implemented measures to save energy. So it would not be a really fair comparison. So let's see. Then the next question, question number three. And uh, this question is about, does your facility know what facility processes or operations use the most energy? The intent here is, to begin with, a facility must be able to evaluate its, en its energy uses by completing an entire facility analysis. It discovers where in your facility you use the most energy. Within this dis with this disclosure, strategies can be developed to reduce the energy usage and also produce prioritize the most relevant factors. So if you know which machines, which departments, um, that use the most energy, then you can uh, put your most efforts there. And a first step would be to map out your production processes together with a list of all machinery installed. And then your energy use parameters and energy use data. You may wish to evaluate also if you possibly need to have more meters installed in order to be able to measure actual consumption at a more detailed level. And this analysis is really important because when you begin to, um, to decide which measure you want to take in order to save energy, of course, you want to focus on the most energy intensive processes or operations. And the next question, based on that, you can set your targets for improving energy use or greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, if you have done so, you can select the sources of energy for which your facility has set an energy or greenhouse gas reduction target. And in order to get full, and this is what it looks like, here is a screenshot of the table that you can complete. In order to get full score here, you need to target more than 80% of your consumption when setting goals. So remember that if you set targets, do make sure that you cover at least 80% of your total energy consumption. If you target less than 80%, but still uh, more than 50%, you will receive partial points. And as you can see here, the target that you uh, should insert should be uh, minus if you want to save and in percentage. So in this case, um, it had been a, a, a target set with minus 3% savings to be saved in 2019. The next question is about the implementation plan. And as I mentioned, this is really an important uh, element of your program. So does your facility have an implementation plan to improve energy use and or greenhouse gas emissions? And you also need to upload a copy of the plan. So answer yes, if you have an implementation plan in place that demonstrate that you are taking action to achieve your targeted reductions. 
and answer partial yes if you have a plan but have not started on all action items. And here you can see a screenshot of some elements of such an implementation plan. And um, the How to HIG actually have has a template for you available. You can uh, click on the link uh, at the bottom of this slide and you can download the Excel table with the implementation plan. So the intent of this question is to maintaining an action plan. It supports you with target setting and is an important step in managing your energy use. Uh, and, but it also means that your site might take action to make reductions. And so when you complete this table, you make sure that you know which measures you want to take. Um, you also make sure that you have someone who is responsible for it and also what are your deadlines. And obviously, if you set an annual target, you should not uh, just monitor on an annual basis. So at the end of the year, check if you have saved energy. Really, you of course, you need to do this on at least a monthly basis to make sure that you can really reach your target. And if you are not doing that, you need to take other measures, additional measures. And then uh, the question six, has your facility improved energy consumption compared with its baseline? If yes, select all sources of energy that have been improved. So here it is suggested to upload an energy tracking report showing reductions for energy sources from the last calendar year. And again, to achieve full points here, if reductions have been made in the last calendar year, then uh, you have to have uh, savings that make up 80% or more of your total energy use. And you get partial points if you have between 50 and 79%. Then here is an example what it will look like. So we will ask you during the verification to see all the items uh, that you see here in this list. And um, we also think that it would make sense to use Excel to keep all your data in Excel and keep it on an annual basis and always use uh, the same and, and keep also all your calculations in there, including baseline years, baseline year calculations, uh, tar uh, uh, target calculations, etc., so that you have everything in one place. And now here, question seven is already the last question in the energy section. Were your facilities annual scope three greenhouse gas emissions calculated in 2018? And here you can report if you have calculated your scope three greenhouse gas emissions and also describe your scope three calculation. This question is actually not scored. So if you answer no here, you will not lose any scores. You will still be able to reach 100 uh, scores in this section. And just as an example, calculating scope three emissions for factory operations, it's a very, very advanced practice. It can provide, but it can provide in useful insights and also support your own reporting. And here you can see an example of potential scope three emissions. So in the list here, purchase goods and services, capital goods, uh, waste generated in operations, business travel, employee commuting, etc. They all belong to scope three. And now I would like to give you just a few examples that are relevant for your facility's energy consumption. And I would like to show you an energy use breakdown as well as how typical, in, um, and then after that, we also have some best practical exam practice examples from the Nat Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC, and their report on energy best practices for textile mills. So let us go there. Facilities are equipped with and demand various sources of energy. The shown pie charts here, they show a breakdown of typical electricity and thermal energy use in a composite textile plant to give you a general overview. So you see here, for instance, that spinning consumes the largest share of electricity in this, uh, in this particular uh, breakdown. 
and then which is followed by weaving. And when it comes to thermal energy, wet processing like desizing and bleaching combined with finishing consume the greatest share, in this case of 35%. So this is the type of breakdown that you can also make uh, when you uh, decide where to, where to put your efforts. And then uh, over to NRDC and some of their best practice examples. The NRDC conducted five expert efficiency assessments of real world manufacturing practices. And they identified incentives that would immediately make typical production processes more efficient and deliver substantial environmental improvement at the same time. To minimize losses and achieve the best practices demonstrated above, specific engineering improvements to factory infrastructure are required. According to NRDC, a mill that implemented all of the recommended energy best practices identified would save up to 1200 kilograms of coal per tonne of production, representing between 11 and 31% of its total fuel use. So if it's not coal you are using, it can be uh, diesel oil or electricity. And um, to pick a few of those examples, let's have a look. So for example, recover heat from Hyotrin's water, for instance, refers to the large quantities of very hot water used to rinse fabric. This heat can be beneficially captured and used for preheating the incoming water for the next hot rinse. And then if you use coal, pre-screen coal, a spiral coal screen technology greatly increases the rate of separation of good and bad quality coal, which also increases the calorific value of the fired coal. And then we have also um, an area where you can save up to 5% of the total energy. So leak detection to save energy by making sure that you have no leaks, preventative man maintenance and also improved cleanings. We also have, for example, energy savings from the reuse of condensate. But there are also many other measures. So for example, lighting. Uh, to move to, to change to LED lighting is something that we see a lot in garment factories. And also, for example, uh, to change to servo motors for sewing machines, if you, are, if you are, have sewing machines and in a garment factory. And so there are many other measures than just those uh, reflected here. So please go, there is the link uh, available here at the bottom of this slide. Please go and have a look at their study. And uh, it's uh, actually quite interesting to read. And with that, I would like to open up for questions and discussions. So I hope that you have a lot of questions for me. So let me see if I can open up here. Here we go. Yes, about the slides. Yes, of course. So all of you who are attending uh, or have registered, you will receive an email after this webinar with the presentation and also with this recording. And here we have an, one question. The energy is used in different areas. Should we take only the energy consumption in production? No, I would suggest that you take uh, all your energy uh, consumption. So not only the actual production, but also uh, infrastructure, uh, offices you have, uh, so that you have a complete picture of your total energy use. Is energy audit a must to capture this data? And you can do an internal energy audit as well. Uh, there are... Um, uh, approaches available where you can uh, where you can use a checklist to uh, to make your to conduct your own energy audit. It is of course also possible to use external consultants uh, for that. And then here we have one uh, comment also. Hi, I think the meter unit of fabric is a bad unit to track performance in textile factories. Um, yes, I agree with you. I think it, it is quite difficult uh, to do this uh, because it also depends a lot about uh, the processes you have 
if you have a lot of different um, different units and uh, different processes, it it may be difficult to use the meter unit of fabric. And but it's it is also in general, I must say, it is really a challenge to um, uh, to find the best ma measure to normalize. And uh, so uh, it's I think often you need to tailor make to tailor make it to your own production and find out what is the best way for you. Um, you can of course also compare with absolute values, but as I mentioned, if your production goes up or down, uh, it may really uh, be um, it may not give comparable results if you use only absolute values. So it's a bit of a trial and error, I think. And how we verify those quantities. So we do that by looking at your production records um, uh, and at your energy records, your uh, energy bills, for example, uh, to have a look at your meter, um, meter and their records. And then uh, I have one question here as well. What percent of factories are using HIC to its full extent? Uh, could you please just explain uh, perhaps uh, what you mean by that? You mean, mean using it at all levels? So it has been possible for the factories to move up to level two, levels two and three. And as you know, just as a comment, uh, if you, if you uh, don't reach level one, if you don't uh, respond yes or partly yes to all questions at level one, it will not be possible for you to move up to levels two and three, section by section. So there is a gateway there. And if you need to calculate indirect greenhouse gas emissions, so uh, your uh, scope two, I guess you mean by that. And uh, actually the HIC platform, the module should calculate your greenhouse gas emissions, um, scope one and scope two combined based on your input into the tool. And then a question about how to measure scope three. Yes, it's uh, very detailed and you saw the list of all the different uh, emissions that would gain, go in there. So it's a very detailed study you need to make. Um, it's quite compli complicated and you need to collect a lot of data, of course, from your external uh, providers as well. I have one question here. Is there a benchmark on target setting, for example, three years? versus five years. No, um, there is no such benchmark. Uh, it's really up to you as a factory so set, to set your targets for three years or five years or perhaps even 10 years, um, although it's a very long term perspective. You know also that in the EMS section, the question two there about strategy, you do need to have a strategy that reaches at least three years into the future which means also that you do need to have energy goals that at least reach uh, three years into the future. But uh, it's really up to the factory to decide if you want which time period beyond uh, three years that you want to have. No, you don't need to go for a greenhouse gas audit. It's, it's not required. And the question seven, as I mentioned, it's not scored, the question about the scope three emissions. And then a question about what's the formula to set up a reduction target? <laughs> a really good question. Um, there, there is no such formula. Uh, what is important is that you have done the analysis of your different uh, energy consumption so that you know where your energy consumption, where your highest energy consumption factors are. But then also when you decide about the reduction target, you need to consider what is your potential to reduce your energy consumption. So for example, if you have done nothing so far, perhaps you have a bit of an older factory where there are machines that could be replaced or renewed um, or with the, where you could replace the motors, for example. Uh, then there may be a significant potential to reduce your energy consumption. However, for factories who have, that have already saved a lot of energy over the past years, it, it usually gets more difficult to, to save energy as you move forward. 
so this is also something that needs to be taken into account. And then, of course, also, when you have seen where your highest energy uh, consumption lies, you need to evaluate what can I replace, what can I do to save energy? And, uh, for example, uh, to change to LED lighting in garment factories, to change to servo motors are quite low-hanging fruits uh, that you can do. But so you need to basically make this analysis and also make a cost analysis of the different implementation measures and changes that you can make and value them against the actual saving that you can do. And usually you would probably be calculating with um, uh, also return on investment and payback time. So uh, depending on your own factory, you may have specific payback times that you need to reach. Uh, so for example, if you would like to uh, install a uh, solar panel to move over to uh, renewable energy sources. Uh, if you have a payback time of 15 years, it may be difficult for the factory to, to allow that. They may be, have low, lower targets for the payback time. But uh, as I said, there is no uh, specific formula really that you can use. Um, there are a lot of factors that you need to weigh in. And then base year, how many years we can go back maximum? This is also a really good question. And so the how to hit guidance, it doesn't specify how many years back you can go. And so I have seen a, a few factories that actually have baseline years of perhaps 2010, 2011, 2012, which means going back quite a few years. Uh, but uh, also when you go back many years and then it gets more and more diffuse, so to say, and it gets more and more difficult to track. Um, and so it, I think it makes sense to from time to time set a new baseline. So for example, if you usually define your strategy by five year, then you would set a place, let's say you, you define a strategy for 2020, uh, 2025, and your starting year is 2020, then you could take your baseline year 2019 and your goal then long-term goal is 2025. And then when you come to 2025, you would of course revise your strategy and take a new baseline. So it's, but we see very different practices. There are actually factories that uh, also change baseline year nearly every year, which I think is more difficult because then you don't have a stable comparison to have. Yes, and then we have the question about normalized and absolute target. And this is, um, this is going back to the discussion about absolute and normalized. So if you have an absolute target, you have a certain uh, energy consumption in one year, let's say. Let's say it's 100%. And you want to save energy 2% in absolute numbers. Then in the next year, your goal would be to have 98% of the energy that you consumed in the year before. And so this would then be an absolute target measured in megawatt hours, for example. The, uh, the normalized target, that is when you relate the absolute consumption to your production or to something else. So what we see, for example, in, example, in offices or in distribution centers, um, you can uh, relate your absolute values, your absolute consumption values with, for example, number of employees or, for example, square meters. But usually in production units, in factories, since you are producing a product, it makes sense to try to relate the absolute number to your actual production volumes. And when you do that with a calculation example that I showed you with a two kilowatt hour per garment, that would then be a, rel an, an, a normalized value. So then your goal would be not the 100 to 98% in megawatt hours, but it could be the 100 to 98% in terms of megawatt hours per garment produced. 
And then we have the question about how to set the baseline if you plan to shift the facility or building. So this is pretty difficult. If you are going to change uh, building, if you are adding buildings, if you are adding uh, machines, uh, if you are adding uh, people, then it, it is really difficult. So then it would be, it might be better to wait until you have done the change and then set the new baseline. Or for example, to make an estimation of, uh, let's say you had, uh, uh, you had uh, uh, 5,000 sewing machines and now you are going to expand your manufacturing with another 2,000 sewing machines. And then perhaps you could change your baseline accordingly, just um, uh, linear, so to say, uh, with that. But it's actually, it's a very good question and it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy to uh, set targets when your manufacturing is changing. Okay, so there are some more questions, but I think we need to uh, continue now. So the other questions that I haven't responded to here, uh, I have also one question here. Let's take this one. Uh, we have answered all the questions in level one, two, and three, but in the left side bar diagram, it's showing only up to level one. That is quite strange uh, that that happens. So usually you should see uh, the all all bars, so to say, um, for uh, for levels one, two, and three. So I cannot say exactly what has happened here, and it may be that you need to contact HICO to to contact the support function uh, to find out what the problem is here. All right, so thank you for the questions. And as I said, the questions that I haven't responded to here now, I will respond to you in um, after this uh, after this webinar. So thanks a lot for that. And then um, let's continue with just some more information for you. So I also wanted to tell you that there is a tool that uh, the HIG um, Co makes available to you, and that's the HIG FEM benchmark. So the HIG.org platform currently offers benchmarking for the HIG facility environmental module. The HIG FEM benchmarking feature on HIG.org currently includes industry benchmarking as well as energy, water, and waste section charts and compares your own HIG FEM or shared HIG FEM self-assessment and verified assessments with other facilities in the industry. So here, down at the bottom of this slide, you can find the link to the benchmarking guide, and there are also videos available to what, what is available for you. And uh, on this screenshot, excuse me, on this screenshot, you can see an example of what it can look like. So it's a bit difficult to read here, but if you go to this guide, you will find more information there. So you can basically select the type of um, facility you have, etc. So you have many different criteria that you can select for and then you can be compared directly with your peers in, within your group. And uh, before I close, I have some more information to you about our offers. So we offer training and verification in many countries and we have been verifying in several of the countries listed here. So you, if you are interested in verification, please get in touch. Please begin planning and scheduling your verification early. So now it's already end of October. So if you are still wanting to verify, please make sure that you plan for that uh, very, very soon. Time is beginning to run out now. And um, then uh, also we have already held several webinars about the HIG FEM. So uh, here you can find the links if you want to listen to, for example, the first in this, uh, the first webinar in this series, where we looked at site info and permits. And there are also a few others, for example, specifically about what to expect on the day of your HIG FEM verification. And finally, the last webinar here is not about the HIG FEM, it's more about management systems and why management systems are really helpful to drive performance improvement. Um, and so if you are interested, please uh, keep in touch and please contact us. 
you can go directly to our booking page here and just book a time slot for a call with me. Or you can email us, uh, either me for global um, or in Turkey, you can email Aladdin, uh, or in Bangladesh, for Bangladesh, you can uh, email Hafiz. And we have come to our final slide. So this is one slide about our company. And here you see some of the our team members. We also work with additional uh, verifiers and additional freelancers uh, globally. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you so much. There will be a survey with a few questions available after this webinar. If you can uh, respond to these questions, it would be really helpful for us to get your feedback. And we are so grateful for your input. So, so please take the time to respond to the survey. Thank you for joining us today and goodbye. And as I said, you will receive an email with all information with the, the presentation and the recording in a few days from now. So thank you and goodbye.